Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Minority Arts Appreciation Society podcast. I'm Matty. And I'm Josh. And welcome to our Lego Movie 2, the second part discussion. Today, we're getting right into it. No, I'm sorry. We're not actually talking about the Lego Movie 2. We're going to be talking about Velvet Buzzsaw and The Devil's Backbone. Josh, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well, thank you. Pretty excited to discuss these two movies. I think they complement each other in a weirdly good way. Yeah. I don't know if you intended in picking them. I accidentally realized I made this kind of a horror episode, but both yeah. of them are quite also light on the horror elements. Do you not? Yeah. <sighs> Ooh, well, that's a. <laughs> Sorry, I, I dipped my toes in a bit early there. I'm that's sorry. a debate. Oh, oh, apologies. Um, no, I don't think it'd be that controversial, don't worry. <laughs> um, so both film discussions will be about 20 minutes, hopefully. Um, and we'll also be just discussing our favourite films of the year at the end of the podcast, so stick around for that. So, Josh, Velvet Buzzsaw, I'm going to start with you. All right, well, my experience watching this film was... Uh... A unique one to say the least. Um, I, I remember I decided to watch it in my my flat kitchen, um, so I had company with me. Uh, my flatmate Will sat down with me to watch it, and um, you know it's always interesting to watch a film with somebody else because um, you know it's, it's a part of me feels like films are meant to be watched in in crowds. You know you get the cinema experience, you see how other people around you are reacting, and when you react in similar ways, it's a very like powerful kind of feeling you know and the film started you know and uh we we're both uh interested intrigued we we're enjoying jake jennifer's flamboyant performance uh mm. we enjoyed seeing the woman from uh that british show about uni fresh meat fresh meat yeah the jack white was show and you know we we're into it and then there was, there was a certain point in the film uh where we realized what it was really about uh, and we both just laughed uncontrollably, and we couldn't believe that this was actually where the film had decided to go. It was, it was a beautiful, beautiful moment of just two people connecting over sheer bafflement over what they were viewing, and it really validated all of my feelings of confusion, upset, and anger at what Velvet Bustle became in the last hour and a half of the movie. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I didn't like it, I'll be honest with you, but it was entertaining in, in points where I didn't think it was trying to be entertaining in the way that I found it entertaining, but that's how I experienced it. How about you? Yeah, um, I'm going to agree with you. I did not enjoy this film. Um, I think... For me, I describe this word as bloated, and not only bloated, but sporadic as well. There's mm. so much story elements and so many characters that I kept questioning. Why are you here? What did you do? What purpose did you serve? What the hell did John Malkovich do in this <laughs> entire film? Gave it credibility. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But... No, I agree. Um, the the art coming to life and killing people uh, sounds like an episode of a kids show, uh, and not and not a kids show that's a horror kids show, a Halloween episode of a normally family friendly kids show. I thought the horror was really weak, um, just and and kind of out of the blue, frankly. Um, mm. Dan Gilroy has described this as a horror comedy. Hmm. And both are so weak. Like I It wasn't I, funny. Watching the, yeah, watching the film with that knowledge, I was like, I'm not scared and I'm not laughing. And the the characters weren't very interesting. The characters the characters only existed as parodies. And they, but they weren't funny enough for that to be entertaining. You when you do a parody of a character, you have to pick one side. You have to you have to make them hilarious enough that you don't care that they're unrelatable in any way. Or you make them relatable and you kind of go on a journey with them that teaches that gives you the film's message in another way. Mm. The film just completely fails in this aspect. I didn't relate to any of the characters, and therefore I didn't care about anything that was happening to them. So even even with the horror being weak, there was no stakes for me. 
So that couldn't make up for the weak horror elements. But yeah, sorry, that was quite a sporadic discussion. But um, what did you think of the film's characters? Yeah, I mean, like you said, it was all very shallow and weak. Um, I remember I was when I was watching it with Will, there was a specific character who was wearing like air airbuds. Is that what they're called? Oh, the kids yeah, are wearing AirPods. 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 Cool there we go. Um, hello, fellow kids. And I'm um, very sorry. I'm very sorry, Josh. But I would. I I just realized I haven't said this is a spoiler discussion. Um, and you know that's very important. Just to know mm. both, both the both the film discussions they will be yeah. discussions. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. And yeah, um, we were watching it, and I was asking, like, is the fact that his character is wearing AirPods is that not pulling you out of the film a bit? Is it not pulling you out of the experience? And he says, "Oh, not really." And then, and then watching the film, you know, I, I jokingly said, "Oh, maybe like, you know, maybe the AirPods, you know, they symbolize this chasing of clout, and and every character in this film is chasing clout, you know, and that's why they're going to get punished." And it was a joke. But then the film was so thin and shallow that I genuinely believe that is like an authentic, thematic interpretation of what the film is trying to convey. Yeah. It, there is nothing nuanced or or kind of complex in the storytelling of this film. Uh, like you said, it's convoluted and very simplistic. Um, uh, every now and then there were maybe like red herrings, like, you know, at points you thought Jake Gyllenhaal was a crazy psychopath maybe because he was so... The way he was playing it, I, I guess I felt like he was directed to play it as if he could be like an American psycho type of character. Mm. Mm. Uh, but that didn't really go anywhere. They don't really explain why he's the way he is. Um, it's just a pure red herring. Again, a, another shallow aspect of the film. Um, it was also, in terms of shallowness, it was shot in a really bland way. There was, oh, a, there was the bit. The film. Yeah. I think the, uh, the part where it hit me the most is in the first 20 minutes uh, when, you know, when they're just at the art gallery looking at the art. Oh, yeah. And it, I talked to, I turned to Will and I was like, this feels like I'm watching a TV show with really shit budget. Like, it doesn't feel like a movie at all. And he was like, well, you know, I mean, it's a Netflix movie and maybe it's like a lower scale. I swear to God, the haunting of Harrowdown House, is that what that's called? Haunting Hill, Hill, House. Hill Haunted House. Hill House, Haunted House Horror Show, <laughs> looks so much better than this. Yeah, uh, yeah. Stranger Things is shot like a competent feature film. Ozark. Ozark this is great. awful. Ozark as well. This film just looked cheap. And like there was no effort put in. There's yeah. no talent. I mean, you think about horror comedies, you know. You think about... Uh, Think about something like Evil Dead. Everything about mm. that film screams kind of uh, comedy in the camp and uh, how much it satirizes the horror genre. But it's shot in such a unique and like wacky way that um, it really enraptures you in its world. Uh, whereas this just completely alienates you as a viewer and how bland and static all the shots feel. Uh, it was incredibly dull. Yeah. I'd like to talk a little bit about Dan Gilroy. Um, Go ahead and compare this to his previous film nightcrawler which in my opinion is one of the best films of the past 10 years i agree i and, adore that movie and there's very very clear reasons for that when you compare it to this film and i think the main reason is focus everything in nightcrawler exists to essentially get tell tell the story of our main our central character jake dylan's central character whose name slips my mind right now, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and the way it looks, every scene, which I think is the most crucial aspect and the aspect where Bel Velvet Buzzsaw fails most, um, every scene is a logical progression of his character's descent into immorality. Mm. Look at Vel Velvet Buzzsaw. It feels like every scene is picked from a hat and you don't know what character you're going to see next. <laughs> You don't know what action they're going to be performing. <laughs> at what at one point, Vod from Fresh Meat breaks up with him, and I was like, "Wait, when did she break up with him?" Like, and she's just sleeping with someone else in the next scene. I was uh, so do you confused. recognize the actor she was sleeping with? Um, I thought it might be the guy from Blind Spotting, but I wasn't sure. 
David Diggs. Uh, he's from the noise rap group Clipping, Whoa. who are incredible. And he's also he was also big in um, the original run of Hamilton. He was in the original cast of uh, Hamilton in 2016 oh, or 15. So yeah, I was really happy, but also sad to see David Diggs in this film. Like nothing in this film serves serves to reinforce Dan Gilroy's message, um, which mainly was about the role of the creator in art and how and essentially how much freedom you should give the creator i'm sure me telling you this now you had no bloody clue that that was what he was trying to convey no clue i thought it was about like well the reason why it didn't come through is i think (laughs) okay this is basically a slasher movie uh in the last half, you realize that the, the most fun you're going to have in this movie is the kills, right? Mm. So making the killer just generic paint, <laughs> and not like a, a person, or at least like a paint ghost or something, a, a, a villain with motivation that would be memorable would mm-hmm. help a lot with caring. Did you find any of the kills visually interesting? Okay, this is my biggest gripe. One of my biggest gripes in the movie is I think there's one good kill in this whole movie, and it's the it's I think it's actually generally think it was excellent. Um, they set it up wonderfully with the beginning art scene with the people putting their hat arms in um this like metallic sphere. Uh, um, and uh, later of on, it's with Tony Collette that you love it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know how I feel about Tony Collette. Anyway, later on, uh, yeah, she puts her hand in there and just blood flies everywhere. And it's generally, it's a really harrowing image. I think it was really well, like, directed, well shot. Mm. The sound effects are really great there. That was awesome. And then the rest are just laughably bad. I was like, okay, um, I'm watching a Goosebumps episode. I can go with this. Yeah. I can like vibe yeah. with watching paint kill people. Like I, we could have fun with this concept, right? If this was Sam Raimi directing this, we would have fun with paint killing people. But there were just horrible, horrible kills. Like the Jake Gyllenhaal's death was awful. It was one of the worst movie deaths I've seen. Oh yeah, just got... just like a stock neck snapping sound effect and an off-screen kill. Oh. <sighs> Um, on the on the Tony Collette kill, yeah, I totally agree. And it's almost it's horror comedy. It's kind of it's like ridiculous in its um scale, like just the blood flying out of all the different holes in the sphere. Without the shock value, I think you can could find some comedy in that. Um, hmm. I have one little thing about that though. When she pulls her arm out and you see the stump, the CGI is really bad. And but. Mm-hmm. But it, is it as bad as watching paint crawl across the skin of that yeah. woman from Fresh Meat? Yeah, that looked awful. <laughs> that looked awful. And that's the thing. I don't know why the film was so ashamed of showing um, practical violence like Jake Gyllenhaal's neck being snapped, um, mm. but so confident in showing these horrible CGI creations. Like, I don't understand. The Devil's Backbone looks better than this, and it came out 18 years ago. I mean, why were they holding back on the violence? I mean, the only appeal that this film could possibly have is watching paint gruesomely kill people. So why were they holding back on the violence? There was literally no reason to... It's on Netflix. Like You don't don't need to fight to get 13-year-olds to go cinema to see it. So why hold back on the violence? Like, it's still rated 15, right? Or... Yeah, I think only just, but that's but that's but almost. Why not just go all the way? Yeah, why why go? Yeah, exactly. Why why not go all the way? So you're just cutting out a demographic to see your film, but then yeah. also, uh, I guess it's not in the cinema, so just anyone can watch it. But yeah, it doesn't even matter. Why not go all to... the way and have fun with it? Yeah, I uh, just I don't understand because Dan Gilroy strikes me as a man of vision. Like he wrote and directed Nightcrawler, and he Mm. wrote and directed this. And it's disappointing. Like, I don't know if I'll look out for his next film as much. Honestly, it doesn't feel like the same guy who created Nightcrawler. Not at all! I I hardly even believe you when you say this is a Dan Gilroy film. It upsets me. (laughs) Like, it genuinely upsets me. Nightcrawler was like Scorsese, you know, not just in terms of skill, but it was a very like Scorsese-esque 
film, but at least Martin Scorsese is still making films. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was just really excited to see where that where that was going. I was excited to see this film. The trailer was pretty bad anyway, but and also gives away like every death. Um, so I'm gonna be honest. I I watched the trailer a while back, and I honestly didn't really know what the film was about. I assumed it was about Jake Gyllenhaal going crazy and killing everybody. Mm. Um. That would have so, been way more interesting. Yeah, that's the film I thought I was watching. I was like, oh, this so is sorry for doing that. And then and then and then and then the painting turned his head like a Scooby Doo cartoon. And I was like, oh, oh, this is this is the film I'm watching. I, I see. I, yeah. At least like I think one thing I can give it is the, the before they started moving, the paintings themselves were very creepy, at least for me. I really liked the way they looked. Honestly, the soundtrack undercut all of that. It was just oh. the overbearing soundtrack, the intrusive soundtrack really the, took away the eerie fact of the painting. Oof. And those cheap fake jump scares. Like when with the cat, do you remember when she first goes in? When um, Vod yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I should really stop calling her Vod. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and there's that cheap jump scare, and then when Jake Gyllenhaal goes into the factory and he bumps into the janitor and it goes, Duna! and it's like, come on. But then there's not <laughs> jump scares in the actual horror. It's fine not to have jump scares. More like the less the merrier, but. But then, it, normally with films, there's the fake out jump scares and then the the real ones, and it was just it was just yeah. confusing. The fake out jump scares felt like they were just there to stop you from falling asleep. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. Otherwise, what else would have happened in that scene? She would have gone up to the apartment, picked up some paintings, and left. Um, I want to talk about like the bloating of the film. Yeah. Um, and yeah, to come back to Tony Collette. I just don't understand why her character existed. Um, I guess there's. Well, she was like a devil's wear, devil wears Prada sort of figure, right? She was meant to be like evil, yeah. established, kind of mm -hmm. manipulating. But yeah, yeah. Also, like the film doesn't give her enough time to like flesh that out. Like you're never, I never really got a true sense of her character and whether or not she was like um, the evil person that. <laughs> The uh, more I I don't remember their names because their names are all so cartoonishly stupid. Um, Morph Vanderwart, Rodora Hayes, Gretchen, Josephina, John Don Don, Coco. Oh, these, these are real names from the movie. These are, these are these people. Um, but yeah, there were so many characters and just even scenes um, that I felt were entirely redundant. Mm. just had no actual overall impact on the on the film he was making and and in an artistic film and a film that's not meant to just be for entertainment like that's kind of shocking it's edited by the same person who edited nightcrawler as well so you would mm. think that like this is a this is perfect there should this should be a finely trimmed thriller not and i and yeah i agree the 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 paint killing people that's ridiculous cut that out and just have jake jim and all killing people because that would be so much more interesting um like not just... you could you could have had him like doing it for art or something ridiculous yeah, like that. exactly it could have been really flamboyant and fabulous and the the commentary on the art world in this film it was like me when i was like being like oh modern art is so bad isn't it like <laughs> um, I thought I was being edgy and interesting. It's it's so surface level, and and everything is so cartoonish that you can't take the director's criticism seriously because you just don't feel like it's coming from a, a place of understanding that world and criticizing it. You feel like it's very much an outsider looking in, seeing only the surface, and going back and writing home about it. Mm. it oh, just completely failed for me. Is there anything you liked about the movie? Um, Jake Gyllenhaal was good, but but like again, his character was underused, and it again, it didn't really go anywhere. Um, yeah, I felt bad for him. I felt like he was doing the most with, he was really with absolutely trying. nothing. He, was he really had nothing to work with. I, yeah, it was a sad watch. 
I want another thing I have to ask you. Uh, I did not get this. What was up with the John Malkovich ending of him in the sand? What was going on uh, there? Did you, I would have liked did that. Did you get that? I yeah. So um, I think it's a very small line, but I think it's Gretchen, uh, the Tony Collette character. She says to him, um, "Just go away and do something for yourself." Um, John Malkovich's character was more established. I actually would have quite liked this. Mm. Um, but essentially, he's gone away and he's making art for himself. In, he's making it in the sand and it's going to be washed away by the sea. No one will ever see it. It exists purely for him. Like, it, like tears in the rain? Like tears in the rain. And it, it's really nice. Like It's a really nice piece of symbolism. It's entirely visual. You just see it and with with that small statement from Tony Collette's character, you're like, oh, he's you know he's doing things for himself, but John Malkovich is not the main character, so and or nor is he a developed character because he's so underdeveloped because he's not the narrative focus of the film. That payoff is entirely like worthless, pretty much, because the core focus of the film is a disappointment. So the side point, the side focuses of the film aren't that interesting. So is the message literally they were doing art for money, so the art killed them? Yeah. And they were fake about it, I guess. Like they I... but then but then but sorry. But then This like, is just draining to talk about. I know, right? Just, <laughs> I know, it just makes me sad. But then Jake Gyllenhaal kind of legitimately did care. Yeah. Like he you know, like he he I, I get it like there were some there were some elements of like you know being a bit pretentious and all that but then he also did like legitimately care about the art mm. and yeah so it's muddled it's murky and it's unsatisfying um and just frankly disappointing this is the worst film i've seen in a long time so thank you for that really yeah, uh, this is awful. This is I struck. I wouldn't have finished it if it wasn't for I had to do it for the podcast. I would have like turned it off. Um, I remember like last week you were saying, you know, it's a Netflix film, but Netflix have good films, right? And watching it, I was like, God damn it, Netflix! You you did it again. You bamboozled <laughs> me. You know, and uh, you know they put it. They put it on the front of the site. It looks so pretty. You know, it's got Jake Gyllenhaal's lovely face with his big glasses. You know, looking like Andy Warhol or something. You know, it's so enticing. And you watch it. And it's just like it's like a fart. You know, it's like why? <laughs> why did I have faith in this? Like, why did I think this was going to be good? You know, it's a shiny, oversaturated fart. That's exactly what it is. So I guess would you recommend this film, Josh? Um <laughs> Well, I mean, okay. So let's think about our target audience. Our target audience for this film is like I suppose fans of fresh meat, fans of Nightcrawler, <laughs> uh John Malkovich fans, you know, real classical actor fans. I don't think I've made this clear. I actually like am a huge John Malkovich fan. I love John Malkovich. I I could consider him a classical actor, you know. And then you got uh maybe noise rap fans as well because the three digs in this <laughs> and I, I don't think anyone in any of these groups would get much out of this movie uh no, at all so you know i would i give this the lowest the lowest of not recommends uh it is egregiously bad and not bad enough to even not be boring just bad uh a complete failure uh it's embarrassing to watch some of my favorite actors um like tony collette and jenna hall malkovich kind of oh, lower themselves to this schlock <laughs> it's um i never really want to think about it again honestly and i hope no one else does either i'm really sorry for making you watch it i genuinely had high hopes um i yeah i wouldn't recommend this film on any level um Josh mentioned mentioned schlock, and I agree it's schlock, but it's the worst kind of schlock where it doesn't commit. Much like you compared it to The Evil Dead, that is a film that commits to schlock. Um, 
Whereas this, you're just the whole time going, what is the point? Why are you doing this? Is this funny? Is this scary? I don't know. It is so hard to make a horror comedy work, and Dan Gilroy has not succeeded. Don't watch this film. Which makes me really sad to say. Um, On the topic of horror comedies, um, he could have a scary horror comedy. Oh, Um, For a long time, my favorite horror film was Scream. And people would tell me that, I think you might have been one of them, that that doesn't count as a horror movie because it's obviously a satire. But that that first scene in Scream is hallowing. It's horrifying. You you can just do a well executed horror comedy. Like you can have well executed horror scenes with self awareness and campiness. Like you, it doesn't. You don't have. To, it doesn't have to be such a half ass job. You know. You just have to have fun with it. Mm. You just have to have fun with it and not take yourself so seriously. You yeah. can't criticize the entire art world in your horror comedy. It doesn't really work very well. Really. At least make a good movie if you're going to do that. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I think that's enough on Velvet Buzzsaw. Yeah. Now, I guess it's time to talk about our second film. If that's all right with you? Yep. Um, our second film is a, I'll be honest, a lovely um, period piece, I guess. I think we call this a period piece. Um, from 2001. Uh, directed by Guillermo del Toro, The Devil's Backbone. I'm just going to go right ahead. I really, really like this film. I would <laughs> I would call it a very depressing and harrowing coming-of-age story, in a way. Um, <laughs> and I think, yeah, it succeeds perfectly in what it's trying to do. Que es un fantasma? Que, one of, that's genuinely one of my favorite lines in the film. Yeah, I think this one's gorgeous. Um, I uh, You compared it to Pan's Labyrinth uh, last time, and I can see how, um, I mean, they're both about the Civil War. Um, yeah. they, they do feel like sister movies. Um, it, it certainly, it, it's nowhere near... Um, the the level he will be at when he does Fans Labyrinth, but all of the kind of the seeds of that are here and yeah. very strong. I think there's even seeds of like um Shape of Water in this movie. Mm-hmm. Um it, it comes out of the gate, uh, it's really accomplished, um, really clear in its goals. Um the themes are are, sh- are sharp and clear. it opens with that line about, you know, what what is a ghost? And it has all these lines about, you know, is it repeating the same suffering again and again, this this kind of cycle. And um the film itself, it has a cyclical nature to it, um, which is fantastic. And it plays with that. Um, you know, you see you you see like a flash of images at the beginning without context, you don't really know what they mean. And then as the film goes on and in, in your memory, you know what they mean. Um and I felt the same way with uh, how it told the story of his characters. Um uh the the older man who is like quite horrible to everyone and it kills everyone at the end. Uh he oh, uh, um I can't remember his name. Uh it is uh Yakindo. Yeah. This idea of like cycles, you know, destructive cycles. Um, you really get the sense that in watching the story of the kids and how he treats them, you're also watching the story of him as an orphan and how he was treated. And um it's very subtle and implicit and there's no like over the top flashback scene. It's it's told in a very simple, lovely way. Um that gets across that theme so beautifully. Um I just thought that was really wonderful. Yeah, you said it all, really. Simple is the word I would use to describe it. Everything is presented with such genuinity, if that's a word, that you're instantly wrapped up into the film. You mm. And the film immediately wraps you up in the sort of fear that these children feel at this orphanage by introducing these horror elements. In this world, Carlos really is seeing Santi's ghost. It kind of mm. gives you it kind of instills in you that fear of a new unfamiliar environment that Carlos would be feeling anyway. Yeah. Um and then as the film goes on you realize that 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 ghosts aren't the real fear, that men are the real fear and the present concrete real world is what you should fear. 
and that's what they realized through violence through yeah as you said yukinto's murder of everyone which is horrifying um do you, do you think the ghost was real narratively it kind of is cuz it like drowns him at the end um do you think that is um do you think he do you think, think he an expression of the kids doing it but well you know. well it, i think it was purposefully ambiguous because um they threw a dude in water with tons of gold in his pockets uh so he must have gotten down pretty deep before he got all the gold up and you could easily kind of see him just kind of drowning uh and it was like in the in um carlos's imagination that he sees this as retribution so so he kind of imagines the ghost drowning him um but it could really be interpreted the other way as like he just drowned because he had loads of gold in him and didn't have time to swim back up and like lost oxygen too quickly. Yeah. Wow, I hadn't actually thought about that. I I think I would look to like Dr. Casares and the fact that you see his figure at the very end of the film. And I think I yeah. think Yama del Toro's love for um like the fairy tale elements and the unknown i think i think he does quite like to play play around with that in mm. in a non symbolic way i think he i think he quite likes to include those elements in his film i i disagree i think Guillermo del Toro uh and every well apart from shape of water it's pretty hard to argue the fish monster i mean fish man sorry uh mm. isn't there um even in pan's labyrinth if i hope we get to talk about that sometime um I, in that film, it is very ambiguous as to as to whether or not the world of Pan was real or if it was an escapist fantasy. I think he, I think he loves, uh, especially with these uh, war stories. He loves to talk about the innocence in a time of war, and I think um, he uses kind of ghost stories and fantasy elements like Pan um, as an expression of this innocence and of imagination. Um, allowing for very valid interpretations of, of those not being r real per se no yeah i see i do see them as totally valid um i think i just like to see them more there i think it's i think it it adds quite a lot to that fairy tale feeling and maybe i kind of let that in in guillermo del toro films they kind I think... of have a very enchanting presence for me and it kind of really adds to that. But I think it's—I'd argue—it's more potent if it if it if it if it's not real. Um, and he is, but it's real to the kids. That's the point. Um, that's more beautiful to me. The, 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 this kind of imagination and purity and innocence is what will allow humanity to get through kind of vicious, horrible times such as the Spanish Civil War. You know, this escapism, this these stories we tell ourselves. Um, isn't that shared by everyone in Spain, though? They sort of discuss all the suspicions of everyone. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's definitely a, a theme about humanity, not just children, especially like the Spanish culture, which I don't know loads about other than from what I've seen in this film, <laughs> um, at least for today. <laughs> yeah, I, I, think, I think that's a really valid position. I just personally disagree. I just uh, that's just I don't even really disagree. It's just not really what I get out of the film. Mm. I think it's quite powerful that Santi could be a really very physical presence to them, and that Carlos sees him as a very real physical threat. But actually, it again, it's it's not Santi that is the threat. It, it, you know, Santi is just you know condemned to repeat the past, whereas the re yeah the real threat is men. The real threat is violence, not what, men. What did what did you think about the special effects surrounding Santi? Um, I know at the time they were considered like really groundbreaking. Um, I thought they were okay. I thought they hadn't aged particularly well, but like I can put aside like the slight detachment that you get with you know seeing a seeing a slightly aged visual effect because it's just it's just a storytelling tool really. Mm. What about you? I think um, there were specific aspects of the design choices around it that were really inspired, um, such as um, the stream, 
the the oh, water yeah. the, it was well it was obviously it's like he was constantly in a state of drowning but you don't realize this until the end so uh for the whole beginning of the film there's this really cool effect of like a stream of blood coming from his forehead and it's kind of like uh it's kind of thinning as it goes higher and it's like drifting away and it's so like whimsical but also really scary and sad um i didn't understand like why it was happening and then you realize he was drowned and you see oh he's just constantly like underwater so whenever he's around um yeah whenever he's around you see the uh walls have like these beautiful like watery shadow effects um oh that's really yeah that these ripples is gorgeous um but there were parts where like there were parts i felt like were a bit like early 2000s ghost movie vibe Mm. um like you know the parts of sandals are just in the background looking creepy uh and it was a bit cheesy i felt um, like those little bits those little cutaways to him um but the parts when he really took over the scene and like was the point it was really super effective i kind of want to talk a little bit about the commentary on the spanish civil war here okay i think it's it's really interesting actually because Guillermo del Toro, he's made two films now about the Spanish Civil War, and the Spanish Civil War is one of those, it's kind of dwarfed by the Second World War, but mm. he's a, he's quite, he comes across as quite an apolitical person, I think, like, it's, but like, you follow him on Twitter, he's very, very, very rarely talks about politics there, that kind of thing, like, he doesn't really use his platform much to speak about politics, I feel, um, but when you watch these films, and you watch this, and you watch Pan's Labyrinth, there's such an understanding of the political climate and the also the the cultural climate as well and i think i think that's his main strength is understanding the the human's position in like the in a in a wide scale political conflict and just the effect that that has on the little guy basically I think yeah it's really nice and I, well i think i think there certainly is an apolitical element to his films um in this one, there was a part when um, uh, uh, the lady was was kind of in a disparaging way saying like, oh, we're just a bunch of like leftists looking after these orphans and um, saving this gold isn't going to do anything. There's a sense of like nihilism, like um, no matter what the politics of these people are, this is, is, it's more about the way war treats people, what war does to people, the communities. Mm-hmm. Um, which is really exemplified in how they're kind of like uh, isolated. Um, there's a real claustrophobic sense that you can't go anywhere. And there's these beautiful shots of this long road um, where you can walk out to a town eventually, um, which like you were saying just now, perfectly is serves as excellent imagery for yeah, the human condition and war of pure isolation and alienation and fear. I don't know if I would call him entirely apolitical. Um, well, he's anti-nationalist, of course. Oh, oh of course, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's not, not on Franco's side. Um, it's more anti-war than anything. The, Sp- the Spanish Civil War, it's a real tragedy. It was part of falling to fascism that mm. happened throughout the 1930s. And I think there's essentially you know, there's a, there's a very clear right and wrong side, no matter how you feel about the left and, and the right. The right mm. was the one committing sort of atrocities at the time. Um, mm. And, but I think there's, I think you sort of see a microcosm of that battle uh, in the kids, really. You you know, you have the, you sort of have the fascist figure, the, the oppressive fascist figure that sort of ra- runs the brutalist side of the orphanage. Um, and they come together to defeat him ultimately without the help of the world and i think mm. the that the um that lack of help from the outside world is kind of reflective of the ignorance of other governments at the time like there's that line early in the film i think from dr casaris he says you know england england and france could send people and then carmen says don't be a fool they're not going to send anyone and they didn't they didn't send anyone they didn't send anyone because it wasn't a direct threat to them mm. and and you see that with these kids, they have to, they have to fight for themselves. And it's, you know, I think it's really powerful that I guess if you, if you do interpret, um, Santi as playing a part in, um, just in Yacinto's drowning, 
then it's quite, I think it's quite powerful that a figure of like Spanish suspicion kind of defeats fascism, sort of saying that like true Spanish culture and the true and the true nature of Spanish society will ultimately uh, sort of sustain itself and is what will triumph over fascism in the end because fascism essentially doesn't have a soul. Jacinto only looks for money and power and wealth. And yeah, I think it's just, I think it's, I think the commentary is really poignant. And while it is, while it is anti-war, I think there's definite sympathy for the plight. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, you've changed our view slightly. Um, I think I think you're spot on with a uh, the kind of a uh, view of the the kids joining together and rising up as, as an analogy for the, the Spanish people, um, rising up without external help necessarily. Um, and moving slightly away from politics, I just want to talk about how how wonderful the chemistry between all the kids were. Oh, um, Del Toro really has a knack for getting great performances out of young actors and. Um, I really believed all of the kids. Uh, they were just fantastic. There was no point where I felt like, um, you know, they were stumbling over lines or they were like awkward. Like they felt really natural and they talked like kids. You know, they swore, they smoke. Uh, I love the bit when he tries to trade uh some Aww. food or like a comic for like a, a a realistic naked drawing of a woman he did um it was so endearing and there's so much character and life and personality in these kids they, they felt like real kids yeah and they bicker and they don't get along like jaime um the bully character he could be so simplistic he could be such a boring character mm. but not only because of his tragic backstory with Santi, but just because of his performance. And you see how sort of guarded he is, but and, and the genuine emotions underneath that, you you feel sympathy for him just as much as you do Carlos or another or any other any other supporting cast. And it's it's just really powerful. And it's so and because you care for these characters so much, it's harrowing and terrifying when you see them go through what they do in the second half of the film when they have to endure the bombing or sort of bombing of of the orphanage and when they have to ultimately put down their oppressor themselves because ultimately yes it's you know it's right and just that they rise up against their oppressor but they learn that even like they learn that even in doing so it's a horrible thing yeah the the act of striking another human being down is a horrible thing and i think that speaks to the main message of the film you know war never changes war war never changes yeah but i think i think you got it like you really got a spot on with that analogy of the of uh is it jacinto is that the name yeah, of the villain it's yeah yeah fine. we ain't spanish oh Okay, well, well, you got spot on with um, that analogy of him as the fascist ruler. Because um, one thing I was positive about during the film is I, I didn't fully like understand uh, why it was this kind of domestic tale of of these people. Like it felt kind of detached from the civil war. Um, I yeah, I was expecting like I don't know the bomb to be like a spirit bomb or something and it would go off i, I don't know I, I was i was like why is it why is it such a small scale i, I didn't realize this guy it would just be some guy who sets the place on fire but now i view him as like yeah an imagery and a symbol of, of fascism itself uh yeah it really serves as great analogy and um one thing i like i mean i know you're obviously a huge fan of the shape of water but i, I do criticize and i stand by my criticism of the shape of water for sometimes overly sim simplistic characters and i think um this film does complex characters really well um with um the villain uh he is obviously a fascist and he is obviously horrible but um god there's the the beautiful lines about how he was was it like a prince of a land or yeah. Oh man, and the part when he's looking back on the pictures, like you get it, you understand him, and uh, I felt sympathy for him in those moments. Um, I, I and the actor pulls it off really well. The hardness to him, uh, uh, and 
cane just lying underneath it that he, he conveys extremely tenderly with his performance. Um, yeah, I, I just I thought that was a fantastic aspect of the film. He really reminds me of um, like Stanley Kowalski from A Streetcar Named Desire. Um, oh yeah, that sort of incredibly intimidating physical presence. Mm. Um, and carries those kind of same themes of the the new world destroying the old and yeah and it, with, with you know just with raw power and no sort of sentimentality attached to mm. it and yeah you're right without his character being as well fleshed out and well performed as it is the film would you know it'd still be it would still be a great film but it it elevates it it elevates it to tr- something truly fantastic mm. the name of uh Dr. Cesares, right? That was the old yes, man. Yes. Oh, jeez. His death, man. It hit me. Uh, I feel like his... He, they could have spent... I don't know if they had to cut stuff out for timing, but I feel like they could have spent more time with his character throughout the movie. That's another criticism I have. I feel like we didn't get enough time to get to know him really well or his motivations or what he was like. Um, he was just kind of like the calm old Donny. But um, yeah. but his death, like, God, man, when when the kid notices the flies and he walks back and, like, slowly shuts his eyes, it was such a... T- another, again, another tender moment that was just so striking and beautiful. And this isn't a... It's a pretty low-budget film. It, it doesn't... There's not really much, like, ambition in, in the set pieces here. Um, yeah. But it really gets you in those tiny, small moments that, you know, that get to, that, yeah, really, really emotional stuff. I do see what you mean about Dr. Casares. For me, I find that shift in his character in the second half of the film to be really effective for, like, fleshing him out. Mm. You see him torn down to his bare to his bare bones, you know. In the first half of the film, he's really restrained and everything, and but then you see him with nothing, and that's how when you really, truly understand who he is. Yeah. So I, I I really like his character. Yeah, I love this film. Um, probably I love it past its flaws a little bit, but Guillermo del Toro is one of my favorite directors. His style and his understanding of just humanity never fails to move me. His films is move me in in ways that other films never have and i'll always appreciate him he might not be my favorite director but i'll always appreciate him in a special place for that Mm. i think um i'm very fond of this film as well and i was quite moved by it and i've thoroughly enjoyed it um but i do i do feel like uh toro will go on to make this film again and better in a few years um which kind of retroactively like makes it not less important but i'm I'm more hesitant to give it like the highest of highest of praises because um it is like like, pan's labyrinth is a better film yeah it's still early in his career relatively um it's very accomplished and fantastic but uh, he definitely like had time to grow from this and you don't get the. Uh, I mean, I when I think of Del Toro, I think of like amazing costume design, um, set design as well, uh, and that's just not here. Um, here you get the more raw elements of his directing style, which is a uh, great and intimate and tender. Um, but I think as the director, you would definitely grow after this film. So I'm right in assuming you would recommend this either way. Oh yeah, I'd give this a strong recommend, like for sure. Like everyone needs to watch this. I mean, if they're into it, I wouldn't even really consider this a horror film that much. If I'm honest with you, I mean, how do you feel about it as a horror film? I think it's a misdirect. I think the horror mm. element is is to essentially lure you into thinking that oh, spooky Santi is you know what you should fear whereas really the true horror is presented much more starkly and the violence is just there for you to see whereas santi's always sort of shrouded no i think i think i think the i think calling this a horror film kind of misses the point but also like i get it but what about the horrors of war true (laughs) but you wouldn't call saving private ryan a horror film would you 
I don't know, that feels pretty scary. But um but no, I tell you I see I agree with you. I think it is a misdirect. Like when it started off, uh one of the weaker elements I thought was kind of the horror stuff. Yeah. Uh, I was kinda of like I wasn't really sure how I felt about the film yet. I was like, this feels like a kind of a weak ghost movie at points. But I got that that wasn't actually what the movie was about. It was kind of over bustle in reverse. It tricked me to think it tricked me and became a better movie. <laughs> it was amazing. Um uh yeah yeah it, it really is a family drama i'd say um <laughs> at, at its core well, and totally, like you said yeah. a coming of age film uh yeah i'd give this a high recommend yeah and of course i would too yeah fantastic film by a fantastic director yeah i guess that about wraps it up for our primary film discussions um but we move on to our discussion of our favorite films of last year so my favorite film of last year was um shoplifters um which i didn't go into it thinking it would be i didn't think it'd be bad at all but it charmed me it's shoplifters is a japanese film um it's a family drama it's simply about this very poor family with like incredibly mismatched origins and it's almost a mystery movie and how you're trying to figure out how how are these people related to one another um in a way they appear quite a nuclear family except also with a grandma living with them um but when you sort of dig beneath the surface and as the film goes on you realize that's not really the case at all so is it is it like the proud family movie at all the the disney channel original movie or am i you know what it's almost a shot for shot remake Okay, that's good to know. I'm finally, and now I'm interested. The film for <laughs> you, just it's just the Japanese version. That's all. Um, but no, the film kicks off with them finding um, a little girl. Uh, she clearly like isn't being taken care of, uh, and her parents are clearly kind of abusive, and so they take her into their care. This mismatched family. And the film is really just about that. The film is just about how they learn to care and love this young girl and relate to one another as a family and grow to understand each other more and more. And it's it's just wonderful. Mm. It's just wonderful. The film is gorgeous. It's directed by um Japanese film veter like he's a veteran of family dramas. I think his name is oh, I I really don't want to butcher it. Um Go for it. Just go for it. Offend everybody in one oh, fell swoop. No. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> Uncultured swine. Hirozaku Kareida. Nice. And um, yeah, it's it's fantastic. There is a wonderful scene where they go to the beach. It's on the poster, and oh, it's so nice. Every year, um. I see a lot of horrible things in terms of film and it's always the nice one that sort of slips its way in, but it's not hugely simplistic. It's not as simplistic as a shape of water where it's just, actually, I guess that's interpretive, but anyway, it, you know, it, the ending, you can kind of interpret it how you want, whether or not it's a truly happy ending. Mm. Um, and that's my favorite film of the year. And I'm very happy I saw it and I would recommend it to anyone just go in be prepared for a really slow film and just enjoy the interactions between these incredibly human and wonderful characters. Josh, Sounds what fantastic. was your favourite film of the year? Uh, my favourite film of last year was uh, sticking with the uh, March Halloween theme we've been doing, <laughs> uh, Hereditary. Um, whew, what a movie. Another kind of like fake out horror movie. It is horrifying, don't get me wrong. But at its core, it's a warm and fuzzy family drama. Um, and I say warm and fuzzy in the most sarcastic of senses because it is horrifying and, and hor- gut wrenching and horrible, horrible to watch. Um, I remember when I saw it in the cinema, uh, well, there's a huge kind of like thing that happens in the film that sets off the events that wasn't in the trailers. And I was in no way prepared for this to happen. And I was watching it with a a friend, Joe. And when this thing happened, like, I turned turned to him and he turned to me. And we kind of looked at each other 
Like, is this is this real? Is this a real movie? And then we were just kind of trapped in this theater. And the rest of the film is honestly like it's like a it's like being in an oven and the pressure's just going up and up and up and the tension's just rising. Um the fights that occur with like the mother and the son, uh so like real and gut wrenching. And nothing in this film felt kind of Hollywoody in the sense of like none of the conflicts felt contrived. Mm, um, mm. So there is a really, really good reason for the mother to be upset with the son in this film, uh, and vice versa. But they don't play it like in a way that was telescripted. It's like it kind of comes out organically. Like they obviously love each other and that she's trying to understand him and he's trying to understand her. But, but, but there's again these tensions, right? Um, and the way the actors pull it off, and Tony Collette, uh, God, her performance in this film is just amazing. Um, she got snubbed. She got snubbed, okay, and I'm not over it at all. Uh, I'm still really upset. And um, yeah, it was another Amy Adams. She got snubbed, and I'm, ugh, I'm not happy. Amy Adams part two. Amy Adams part two. Um, but yeah, uh, God, and the directing was gorgeous um there's a really cool effect of um when the film starts it, it looks like it's shooting a dollhouse and tony collette's characters actually makes like model houses and then it zooms in and it becomes like a real house and you see the dad waking up the daughter and it, it just feeds into the themes of the film to say the least but also it was just a beautiful masterful shot the minute the film starts they're like this is something special like this is really special. I'd argue this is probably my favorite horror film of the decade. Uh, and that's not being hyperbolic at all. I mean, you could try and name another one that is as palpable as this um, in terms of sheer horror and uh, drama. And uh, yeah, absolutely adore, adore this movie. Best film of 2018. Do you know it's the director's uh, feature debut? I feel sorry for him because, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think he can top this. I mean, I don't, I think he's gonna crash and burn. And I, I'm very. Coming out this year. I've got, I've got very little faith in directors who come out with like the most amazing film and then yeah. have to carry a career from it because, it, yeah, we'll they end see. up just making the same film again and again, or just being really disappointing. Fantastic. Okay, I think we have ticked all the boxes. I think they've been ticked. And now that just leaves you with some music recommendations. All right. Uh, okay. So, so for the for the first uh, new album that I'd like to talk about, uh, the new Shushu album. Yes. Sorry, I was so yes. Yay. Okay. Cool. I was looking forward to this album, and I haven't listened to it yet. I was saving it for the podcast. Uh, so I don't know what's going to happen. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, honestly, Shushu are a crazy band for me. They can go either way. I've heard albums of them that were like sixes for me and ones that were nines. I have no idea what they do. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Um, and then for the next new album, I'm, I'm, giving, you, I'm giving you a choice. Mm-hmm. You ready? ready? Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, you can choose between Ariana Grande's "Thank You Next" <laughs> or Weezer's "Black Album." Jesus Christ! Now choose wisely. This is the dichotomy of humanity. Um... Choose wisely. Oh, fuck! I can't. Wow. Um. Okay. We, we don't want to oversaturize the podcast with Weezer. <laughs> <laughs> it, this, this is now a Weezer exclusive now, podcast. There must be at least one Weezer review in every episode. <laughs> every Weezer album. <laughs> Apart from Blue and Pinkerton. You know what? Yeah, I'm going to switch. Let's go with Thank You Next. And I'm not happy about it. Awesome. I you can't wait to talk about, about it. it either. I, you know, okay, I'm not going to reveal my opinion, but that's a very interesting album, and I think there are things to talk about. 
Uh, no, there will be definitely things I like. Have you heard any of Black Album yet? No, I've been saving myself for marriage. Oh, wow. I've only heard it once, but it was a... Uh, it was more painful than Teal album because it was meant to be real and it wasn't real. I'm going to be honest with you. It just, the first track's good. Everything else was god awful. Yeah, I just don't think we need to talk about that. <laughs> All right. And for the uh, older album, uh, I want to talk about uh, the Wilco album, Yankee Hotel Foxtrot. Are you familiar with Wilco? I'm not. I'm not. Uh, so you're a fan of Parks and Recreation. I'm a big, I'm a, yeah, I'm a fan. I'm a fan. Do you remember when they get to get, they get that band that broke up ages ago back together for that big uh, like finale thing? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That man was played by Jeff Tweedy, who's the lead singer of Wilco. Lovely. So this is a, an album that I really enjoy, and I can't wait to see what you think about it. Cool. Okay. Awesome. I'm super excited. What, am I, what should I expect? <laughs> Expect some guitars. <laughs> oh, cool. I like guitars. <laughs> Matty O'Neill, 2019. I like, I guitars. like guitars. Proof that rock is not dead. <laughs> <laughs> rock is dead and it's a good thing. No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Well, that's all. I mean, that's all. That's all the music. So Ariana Grande, Shushu, and Wilka. A good, diverse crowd of music. I'm really sorry for yelling when you announced Shoo Shoo. That's the type of enthusiasm we need on the podcast, Manny. If we're yes, going to go anywhere. We need at least three yells per episode. All right. I guess we should wrap this up and say goodbye. Thanks very much. Thank for you for listening. listening. I've been Matty. I've been Josh. Good night.